Okay, our guest Edward Hasbrook grew up on one, Route 128. He now lives in San Francisco, but spent most of last year in the Boston area. As a travel writer, he's published both in print and online as a staff writer, freelancer, and self-publisher. He joined the NWU to get advice on the contract for his first book, which remained in print for more than 20 years through five editions. He was co-chair of the book division for more than a decade and did, did wonderful work, um, represent the NWU in several international federations and as a member of the Authors' Right Expert Group of the International Federation of Journalists, and during um, a three-year term as the sole representative of writers worldwide on the board of directors of the International Federation of Redu Reproduction Rights, not to be confused with reproductive rights organizations. He has received a Lowell Thomas Travel Journalism Award for investigative reporting from the Society of American Travel Writers Foundation and a 2021 Social Courage Award from the Peace and Justice Studies Association for exemplifying courage and honor in speaking truth to power. And he's just been a, a wonderful leader in, in all the battles that the union has been trying to fight on behalf of uh, e copyright equality and, and all that kind of thing. So here he is, Edward Hasbrook. Thank you, Barbara and uh, Willie, for hosting this and everyone from the Boston chapter. It's uh, always a pleasure to be back in Boston with you, even if today only uh, virtually. My goal today is to share some of what I've learned over the years from NWU members and other writers about the different ways writers manage to make a living from their writing. You know, when I travel around to NWU chapters or when I'm meeting with writers from other organizations and coalitions we work in or at the international meetings I attend, I always ask two questions. One, what are you writing? And two, how do you make money from that? And I, I don't think it's any surprise that, you know, people write about in all kinds of genres about all kinds of things, whether it's, you know, poetry or uh fiction or journalism or, you know, there are people who make their living writing grant applications for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what is surprising and less recognized is how different the ways that writers are, are getting paid for their writing are. Um, I think people tend to assume that even if we are doing different kinds of writing, we still are in a similar kind of business as writers. And what I found is that that is much less true than most people think, especially if we we hang out with other writers like us, naturally. Um, and so we may not realize that there are whole other circles of people who are doing things in wildly different uh, ways. So I want to share some of that in the hope that it may open up, you know, for each of you, maybe some different possibilities that you hadn't thought of. Um, next slide, Willie. So, you know, uh, there's a there's a tendency to pessimism, and to some extent, it's justified. Print markets and revenues are declining for writers, but things aren't as bad as we think. In reality, people are reading more than ever. Look around you. How many people are reading, even if it's you know reading on their phone, but they're reading, and if they're reading things, somebody is making money from it. In fact, more money is and ever is being made from the publication and distribution of written work. Um, that is, uh, that's, the, the issue isn't whether money is being made. Um, the issue is um, how much of it we're, we're getting. You know, Facebook and Google each made over $100 billion last year. Um, some of that was from ads on videos, but most of that was from ads on things that people are reading online. So the issue again isn't isn't how the issue is how the 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 pie is being divided, and so I think the fundamental issue is that there are ways to make a living as a writer if we can get paid our fair share. Next slide. 
So there is um, there is really no uh, typical writer. Um, most of us have multiple revenue streams, and uh, as I said, we have uh, very different um, different business models. As I talked about at the at the NWU delegate assembly in a, a presentation that you can find on the on the NWU website, um, the most commercially successful writers probably are the least representative of the long tail, which is to say most of us. So there's a certain risk in trying to model what we do on what's working for people who already have a level of commercial success that's that's unlikely. We may learn more from talking to other writers like us, but we do have to be creative and entrepreneurial. You are running your own business as a writer. Um, next slide. So I want to work through a sort of taxonomy of revenue streams for writers along five different dimensions. First, are you generating money from the front list of new writing or from your back list of things you've written before, but that you can get more money for? Second, are you writing and publishing in print or in digital formats? Um, third, what kind of business model do you have? And I'll get to what that means for your writing, how, what your relationship is with the people who are paying you. Fourth, what kinds of revenue sources um, you're generating money from? And fifth, what kinds of publication formats you're publishing in? And I'll, I'll go into each of these in turn. Next slide. So the first of these dimensions um, is whether you are, you know, if you, if you think of yourself as a business, these are um, uh, major classes of assets, your ability, your labor power to create new writing, your, your, your library of rights to things you've written before, and your what a business would call brand equity, which for a writer is your reputation, your fan base, etc., cetera, uh, in your personal brand. I'm not going to talk a lot about personal branding, but it is an asset class, um, you know, that uh, if, you know, you were, if you were a business, if you were a corporation, you'd recognize this on a balance sheet as having value and you can generate value from it. But um, just as much of the net worth of a corporation may be in its intellectual property assets, uh, a writer's personal backlist may be a substantial part of their net worth. Now, one of your major choices as manager of your personal business is figuring out how to prioritize time and effort and investment of money. Should you put your work into trying to, you know, from a business point of view, should you put your work into trying to write new things that will generate more money? Or is there more return on investment to putting at least some of your time into trying to monetize the rights that you hold the things that you've previously written? I had a really interesting conversation a few years ago with somebody who'd worked on the digitization of the New York Times archives. And I asked them, you know, was this something you saw as, as a cost and an expense that you were doing as a service to your readers? Or was this a, a profitable line of business? And what he said was, oh, no, this is definitely profitable. And we were able to sell it to management to invest the time and money in scanning our archives, um, which is something that they did pay some to writers to as a result of a series of successful lawsuits by the NWU. First, the Ticini New York Times, which, which set the precedent. And then there was a follow-up class action lawsuit that resulted in at least some payments being made to those whose work in those archives were scanned. Not enough, but at least something. But anyway, he said, we had a, a one-time expense to scan these archives, to set up the system for putting them on the web. But then once we'd done that, they could continue to generate revenue for the life of the copyright. And over that period of time, this is clearly a profit center. And rights to works that have already been published are often described as secondary rights in copyright terminology because they're rights to second or subsequent publication. But don't let this terminology mislead you. Revenues from secondary rights are actually the primary source of income for many writers, and that's especially likely for older writers with large backlists, and crucially even for younger writers, for rights to digital uses of works that were previously published in print, but that haven't yet been made available in digital formats. And to get ahead of myself a little bit, um, 
for many writers, one of the sweet spots of the, the highest return on investment, not instant money, but highest return on investment, if you haven't done this already, is putting in place some mechanisms to generate at least some ongoing revenue stream from the things that you've written in the past, particularly, again, stuff that you've written that was published in print, but that isn't yet available online. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, here we have uh, a second you know, dimension of revenue, which is print versus digital. And we all know sales and revenues and freelance rates for printed newspapers and magazines and stuff are falling. But people are reading more online, whether that's on their computer, on their Kindle, on their phone. And so if there's a chance to make up some of the lost print revenue, pretty obviously it's from digital sources. And this ties into what I just said, because rights to a lot of backlist works, especially short form works, you know, short articles, whatever, it's kind of hard to do anything with those in print forms, because um, you can't effectively distribute, you know, off prints of an article and sell them for 50 cents. But in digital formats, you can make use of these. So um, it's no surprise that the internet has unlocked a lot of potential value in backlist works that were previously published in print. And given these dynamics, it's no surprise that one of the central issues for the NWU from 25 years really has been how to divide these new revenues from new digital uses of works that had appeared in print backlist. And it's a core dispute with publishers because there's a lot of money here. And that should be a clue to writers that if you're not focusing on this, you may be leaving potential money on the table. Um, next slide. The third dimension of revenue streams um, for writers is what kind of business models, by which I mean, are you an employee? who gets a salary, an hourly wage, maybe has benefits, God forbid, um, and is eligible for workers' comp and unemployment and all these unimaginable things? Are you maybe a freelancer or are you a self-publisher? And it's really important to understand that self-publishing as, is as different from being an employee or a freelancer as being an employee is from being a freelancer. And then this item two is, you know, independent contracting can run the gamut from things that are much closer to being an employee, but that are paid on a 1099, but where you have a regular expectation. For example, you have a contract that you get paid a monthly fee to you know, edit or produce or write a newsletter or, you know, a fee to produce so many blog posts for somebody's corporate blog. Um, or on the other hand, you know, it can look much more like freelancing. But these are, these are very different kinds of relationships that involve you in dealing with different kinds of intermediaries of whatever. Next, um, the fourth dimension um, here is... Uh, of, of income streams is in revenue sources. Um, you can sell your work, most obviously in things like selling copies of books, um, or you can sell the rights outright with a, for a one-time fee. And you should be cautious about selling things outright, um, basically because when you sell them, that's it. You can't do anything more with it once you've sold it. You know, but it's not necessarily wrong. It may make sense in some cases to sell something outright if you can get enough to be worth it. But think carefully before you sell out all your rights because you may be selling out, you know, rights that you haven't thought about that may have more value than you realize. Secondly, there are, you know, wages, a completely different way of getting paid. Um, and similar, as I mentioned, you know, these kind of wage like contracting fees. A third way of generating income is through advertising. You know, advertising is not new. Many newspapers have been, you know, you know the alt weeklies were all entirely ad supported for decades, basically. So there's nothing unusual in an ad supported publication. Um, this is not a new thing with the internet, but on the internet, you know, most of the revenue is ad revenue. I hate ads, okay? And I don't like a lot of things about the online advertising marketplace, but the reality is that this is a multi hundred billion dollar you know, market, it's the primary revenue channel for digital work. And if you're not thinking about it, you're leaving money on the table. Um, there's licensing, um, which is may or may not be um, uh, a good revenue stream. For most people, that tends to be 
a more secondary revenue stream, but there are possibilities for licensing your work, um, particularly if you can license it on a non-exclusive basis or for a time limited basis. So you're not you know, basically giving up all rights for a one-time licensing fee. And the final thing on here is subscriptions and memberships, which can actually be quite interesting. You know, there's been a lot of focus lately on some new platforms like Patreon and Substack uh, for that writers can use for subscriptions. Although if you work for through Patreon or Substack, you're basically building their brand and reputation rather than your own. There are ways, uh, there's a self-hosted tool called Ghost. You'd probably need to pay a consultant to set up a Ghost instance, but it's something that you could use um, to, to, to achieve some of the same functions of having a subscription-based uh, membership kind of website for your content or email newsletter for your content. Um, and the good thing about subscriptions and memberships is even if they don't totally pay the rent, they can provide a sort of baseline of income, just like a consulting gig that's even part-time, but that pays you a check every month can be a baseline of income when other things like you know book royalties or one-off fees for individual articles can be much more fluctuating. Uh, next. The fifth dimension, so to speak, um, out there in outer space of uh, revenue streams is what kind of formats you're publishing in. I'm going to talking. I'm not going to spend too much time on print publications. I think you know, people know what those are. There's books. There's printed periodicals. I mentioned short form print editions, although generally they haven't. Um, it hasn't been possible in print to generate much revenue, but I flag that because they may have more uses in, in digital forms. The other aspect of publication formats, though, that I think people may be less aware of, you know, some of the options are, next, Willie, um, is uh, digital publication formats. And there, you know, you can, um, uh, digitally, you know, written work can be distributed, obviously, as, as web content. Um, but much of the same content can be distributed uh, as, uh, for example, an app, you know, recipes in a cooking app or sightseeing information in a travel app. And to look back at what I was saying earlier, you know, an app can be an app that is sold for a fee you buy the app, or an app can have in-app advertising. And, you know, it's a tricky choice, which is going to generate more revenue. But, but, you know, I know people who've taken the same content and repurposed it from a website or a book to an app. And sometimes it worked better. Sometimes it's a parallel that they can have the same content in both of those. Um, of course, there are eBooks. There are also other downloads. And one of the interesting things about paid downloads is that, you know, people, again, aren't going to buy a 10 page, you know, off print of an article for 50 cents, but you can sell a digital download as a short form, you know, for, for 50 cents or 99 cents or whatever. Um, email is really interesting. I think most people think of email as a one-to-one -one communications medium, but it's also a publishing medium used to distribute a wide range of everything from marketing communications to paid subscription publications. Think about how much of what ends up in your email box is some kind of newsletter that either carries ads or marketing messages or uh, that you paid to subscribe to. Who writes those? How do they get paid to write them? Most of them, somebody is getting paid to write them. And, you know, they're not necessarily cheap. There's a lot of, and they, they lend themselves often, these lend themselves to self-publishing. So, uh, you know, there's long been a genre of, you know, quite often quite high fee subscription newsletters. I mean, these could be $50 a year, they could be $500 a year. If you've targeted some niche in which you have expertise and you put out a weekly newsletter, it can be a 10 page newsletter and you can get hundreds of dollars a year in a subscriptions. Um, you know, and this is not something new back in the print world. You know, my mother worked as, a, as an editor uh, and writer. Uh, and writer for, uh, for worked, uh, 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 edited for a while as, as editor and writer for a, newsletter, uh, computer industry uh, niche newsletter of this sort. Now, at that time, that was mailed out in printed form. These days, these kinds of things are more likely being sent out by, by email. And again, you could be paid subscription. They could have ads. There are a lot of ways to do that. But email newsletters actually employ a lot of writers. Um, and finally, there are you know, some of these more esoteric kinds of things, using writing in games or in you know, interactive instructional materials. Etc. So more different kinds of digital formats than most people, I think, are probably thinking about. Next, um, 
Now, I've gone through these five different dimensions, and each of these is independent of each other. Let me give you example from, an example from my own work. For much of the last more than 20 years, I've been primarily, in terms of income, although I've had books in print and so forth and so on, I've been primarily a professional blogger. Um, but that's been in wildly different contexts. At one point, I was working for an online travel agency that had hired me in part because of the reputation and following I had from my books as a rainmaker. But I was hired to write informational content for their, for their website, among other things, um, and their blog. And I was an employee paid you know, a salary with benefits full time to be primarily the corporate blogger. Every company has a corporate blog. Somebody gets paid to write it, whether on an employee or a freelance basis. So I was an employee writing a corporate blog. Um, there was also a time when I was getting quite a bit of income, uh, primarily from advertising, from self-publishing my own blog that appeared on my website. Um, and some of the content from that also went into my weekly newsletter. I have, it peaked before the pandemic at about 5,000 subscribers. People are traveling less. It's down to about 3,000. That's built up over years. Um, if you are not collecting names of your fans for a perfect uh, personal mailing list, you're leaving money on the table. Honestly, you just are. Um, but anyway, I, I use some of the same material on my blog and in my uh, email newsletter um, and generate it. And there were years when I got more money in royalties on my books and years when I got more money in ad revenue from my, my website and blog. Um, and for the last uh, period, I've been working for a number of years, more than a decade now, actually, for a uh, nonprofit human rights uh, organization, basically a think tank, where my main deliverable is writing articles for their blog, for a, a nonprofit focused on freedom of movement and the right to travel. Um, and there, it's a, it's a contracting job. It's part-time, but again, they pay me pretty good amount um, on a monthly basis on a long-term contract as an independent contractor, provides some base income, but also leaves me to, free to pursue other projects. That's all being a professional blogger, but with very different kinds of economic relationships and different ways that the money was coming in. And that's just within the realm of travel blogging. I mean, this, this could be going on in other genres as well. Um, you know, we think of the paradigmatic writer as, you know, maybe a novelist or a journalist, but in the digital environment, uh, a successful writer may be getting paid to write marketing copy or product descriptions for an e-commerce website. And I know people who make a living writing product descriptions for e-commerce websites. Um, whatever you read, probably somebody somehow is getting paid to write it, um, except on Facebook, where Facebook has made its money by not paying anybody for any of the work they distribute. Facebook is literally the worst possible place to be published from an economic point of view for a writer. You're giving more money to Zuckerberg, if you write for Facebook. But anyway, um, enough about that. You know, a writer can choose to uh, distribute and monetize a particular work in as many ways as possible. Um, and I know people have gone back and forth on this with the same content or put it out in multiple formats simultaneously. But you might also make a deliberate choice to offer it in only one format that you think will optimize your revenue. And there are people who will look from the outside and say, oh, well, your work isn't available in this format, so that must be a market failure, but that could equally indicate your informed market choice. But the important thing is make a careful choice and look at the potential revenue before you make those choices. Next. So um, if we look at these independent dimensions and multiply it out, we have you know, the options of you know, front list and back list work. Even if we're just talking about digital formats, you may be work that first appeared in print and work that was born digital. We have, um, so that we have those original formats. We have new work versus old work. Uh, I went through five different kinds of revenue sources, you know, salaries, licensing fees, advertising, et cetera. Uh, just in the digital arena, five different publication formats, um, you know, web content, apps, eBooks and downloads, et cetera. You multiply that, that's 200 different ways, giving all those permutations to make money from writing in digital formats. Now, nobody, each writer may have a different mix of income from a different combination of these modes, but it's worth thinking about, as I said at the top, whether there are um, 
what are there some of these that you're missing out on? And um, there are a lot of implications. I'm going to stop shortly and take questions. There's a sort of part two, which I could come back at a, at a later date and go into, which is what are the implications of this diversity of business models for our work, particularly our collective work and our advocacy work as the NWU. But I want to keep this focus just um, for today on some implications for individual writers of these um, of these issues. Uh, next slide. So there's some there are some trends that are going on. And when you're doing business planning, again, thinking of yourself as the CEO of your personal business, which is what you are as a freelancer or a self-publisher, CEO of your personal business, making investment choices that may or may not work out in terms of generating future income for today's work, you've got to be thinking ahead into the future. So it's not just what's making money now, but what's going to be making money in the future. So Having said, this is where things are now. Where is it going? What are the trends? I think there are some pretty obvious trends. One is the continuing trend. Print is not disappearing, but more and more publishing is digital and more and more of the revenue is digital. Um, second trend facilitated by that is a trend from licensing things to third-party publishers to self-publishing. I personally think that overall this is good, although not without its pitfalls, but it's certainly something to recognize. Um, at the very least, in the digital environment, it's a lot easier, not simple, but it's a lot easier than it is in the print environment to self-publish because you don't have to deal with warehousing physical books in your garage or your attic or whatever um, and, and other kinds of things. So, it involves self-publishing as its own quandary, but digital self-publishing, you know, you can start a blog in five minutes, right? Um, so it is easier. And also related to that is a shift from dealing with traditional publishers to dealing with new intermediaries. And this has implications um, also getting a little ahead of ourselves for things like the NWU's contract advisory, because people who are doing self-publishing are not just signing contracts with a publisher, and they may be signing contracts um, with a, uh, a payment processor or with a hosting service or various other kinds of, you know, or with a company like Patreon or Substack. What are their terms like? Uh, much less, what are Google's terms for Google Direct? And then there are these in-betweens, like if you are self-publishing on Kindle Direct, is, is Amazon acting as a publisher or a distributor or something that's not quite either? Um, so we're having to look at relationships with new intermediaries. I think all of those are fairly obvious trends. Next slide. But um, there are some less obvious trends to think about um, that may affect your judgment about where to go looking for more money. Um, one is that, for reasons I've already alluded to, um, more of writers' incomes for those who are thinking about how to monetize their backlist is coming from the backlist because the digital environment is opening up all these new ways to monetize stuff that previously may have been of interest to some readers, but it was published in a magazine five years ago. And what were you supposed to do with it now? Well, now you can put it up today on your website and it can start generating ad revenue today um, if the topic is of interest. There's a shift from long form to short form works. Again, there's. it used to be that if you wanted to distribute in print, really the book was the, you know, book was the, the holy grail. Um, whereas now, Again, for these reasons I've cited, you know, you can get more money out of out of shorter works, um, which may affect what you choose to write. I mean, um, for me, you know, having a successful, well-read in print with a major publisher books has proved to be less and less as time went on of a part of my income. It was worthwhile doing because it built my personal brand. Um, but I wouldn't do it the same way if I had it to do again, and it's proved to be less of a share of my income than I'd expect it to be. There's also a, a shift from a fixed edition where you write something and it's published and that's it, to the idea of dynamic publishing where something can evolve and change constantly. You can even, you know, you can put something up as an ebook and you can keep editing it and changing it um, as things evolve. That creates some interesting possibilities. 
And finally, in terms of the less obvious change, it used to be um, that you could, you know, license the same work to publishing publications in different territories or distributors in different territories. You know, you could license an article to appear in a regional magazine or a newspaper over here in this region of the country and then in that region of the country and to somebody else in this other country. Um, you can still do that sort of in print, but online, anything on the web is available worldwide, so it doesn't really work. But there's an alternative possibility, which is time limited licensing, where you can say, I'm going to charge you this month, a month or a year to have this content on your website. And I've actually done that with some of my travel FAQs and how to's where I've charged a particular website or company so much to put this library of reference material on their website to help you know support the things that they're doing and selling. And they paid me a monthly fee. And, you know, when that contract ended, they had to either, you know, re-up and pay me again, or, you know, ultimately with one of them, a point came where they said, look, we don't want to keep paying you every month. We want to pay a one-time fee and be able to keep using this for the rest of the copyright, in which I said, one, yes, but it's going to be non-exclusive, so I can license this to other people. And two, you got to pay me enough to make it worthwhile. And they gave me a pretty good chunk of change to buy out that, you know, life of the copyright license and left me with the right to continue to reuse that stuff in other places. Um, so, and, and that raises a lot of other issues, but I'm going to stop here. Um, I've been going for a while here. Um, I suspect that there may be questions and I really hope um, that this has given you some, some ideas for some things that will, that will help all of you be successful in making a living as a writer, which is probably why you're in this union in the first place. Tracy has a question in the chat. It says, any questions regarding, any suggestions regarding combining the writing and instructional mode, e.g. doing a webinar for which one's writing is either a required purchase or optional. Related to this is the difficulty of reaching a large market. That's, you know, I, I've done a lot of public speaking, most of it has not been paid speaking. There are a variety of business models historically for paid speaking, and it, it's all over the map. Um, because there's some people where the main income is from the speaking fee. And there are other people where being a professional expert or speaker, the main income is not the speaking fee, but from the sales of books in the back of the room, or signing people up for a paid subscription to their newsletter. So I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but realize it, there's not just one way. There are a lot of ways. And, and what I will say about this is that that it used to be you had to be prepared to travel and there was a certain threshold of you know you know, just like going out and giving book talks it's not worth it your while to go out and give book talks if you're not making enough to cover you know the expenses of going and giving a talk well the cost of giving a talk on zoom is pretty low so i think it has you know the pandemic people's getting accustomed to virtual events has made it possible that there are probably a lot more people who would be able, if they want to, to make a living as a uh, an online speaker or online instructor than used to be. But I can't tell you whether the best revenue model, you know, is, is is that mix. You know, think it through with a business plan. Talk to other people in your field and see how it goes. And you can also experiment over time with with whether you're going to do better by charging more up front to participate or you know to attend the talk, or whether you're better keeping the price of entry low or even free and using it as a hook to get people you know to subscribe or to buy follow up stuff. Um, someone said brilliant, and someone else said, do you have any experience or comments on the audiobook market? Um, I don't have experience um, doing audiobooks. Um, none of my books uh, have been produced in audiobook editions. It's a growing market. Um, one thing I would flag is that while we think about audio books, there's also a growing amount of money, which I didn't mention, and maybe it's something I need to go back and add into that taxonomy. There's a growing amount of money in podcasts. Again, it used to be that if people had to buy 
a tape or a DVD, they weren't going to buy a five minute thing. So it had to be something book length for people to pay for it as an audio book. But podcasts can have, you can either pay to subscribe to the podcast channel, or you can participate in a subscription-based podcast feed. Or what a lot of people do is they have in-podcast advertising that generates ad revenue, or they get paid to interrupt the podcast to read an ad for their sponsor, just like you know, people on the radio interrupt the radio program to read an ad for our sponsor. There's nothing you know, inherently corrupt or wrong with that. So there are a variety of kinds of writing that wouldn't necessarily make a book or an audio book, but that may be saleable in audio form, writing something that, whose primary audience or part of whose audience is in podcasts. And again, you may take stuff that you've previously written as stories, put your own short stories up as a podcast feed and see if you can generate some revenue from that. If you've got a library of old stories you've written, people like reading aloud, right? Um, and people have time while they're driving or whatever, and more and more they are listening to podcasts rather than reading. So I guess that's where I would sort of twist that answer is um, look at the growing podcast market. Yeah. And, he, and somebody says, and this is a good question, I think, you mentioned that it's easy to start a blog what specific steps can be taken to monetize your blog? And the questioner says, I have no idea and would love to know more. And as I said, that's true of at least me and probably a lot of other people. <laughs> well, that would be beyond scope here. Um, and there, there's a couple things. One is, you know, some of this stuff, as I mentioned earlier with self-publishing, you could do it yourself, but you may also need to hire a consultant. And there are all kinds of problems and pitfalls in hiring somebody to work as a consultant for you, especially if you're hiring them to do something precisely because you don't fully understand. But you need somebody who's going to work with you and planning it and not just do it the way they think it ought to be done. Um, but you also have to have somebody with some trust. That's not an easy thing. I would love the NWU to develop you know, a referral list of recommended service providers. We don't have that. So, you know, if you don't feel up to setting up your own blog, you can hire somebody to set one up for you. That said, in terms of the, the money piece, um, uh, my blog generates revenue first through direct ads on the blog. And you can either go out and try and sell ads yourself directly to people who you think might advertise on your blog. And I've done that, going and hitting people directly and say, would you like to sponsor an ad on my blog for X number of dollars a month or whatever it is? The other obvious way is you can sign up with Google AdSense or some other ad broker and you basically write some code into your blog that assigns a block of space and the ad brokerage goes out and places ads. Again, the same way, you know, this is the same way somebody who owns a, a, a building that has space for a billboard. They don't go and find people to buy the billboard. They contract with a, with a billboard marketing agency that has a library of billboards all over the country um, that then goes to ad agencies that will sell, you can be on 50 billboards all over the country. So there are ad brokerages. Again, Google AdSense is the most obvious one. Um, there, you're going to make probably less money through those, but it's less work. You just put the block of code and they'll start selling ads and give you a percentage of the revenue. So there are ways. So you can do it through ads. My blog also generates revenue in a more indirect ways through, you know, selling you know, ads, self-advertising for selling ads for my books. It has boxes to sign up for my newsletter that then gives follow-up ads and information about you know, talks I'm giving and other things I'm doing. Um, there, are also, there are also ways um, you can also have a members only or subscribers only blog that's behind your own paywall. And that's something that things like like Patreon or Substack or Ghost can do is to set up basically your own personal payroll where you've got a paywalled blog for subscribers. And that is that works for some people. Frankly, that kind of model is best known for erotica writers because that's something that people are actually willing to pay a subscription fee for that sort of stuff but it can be used for other things as well. So all kinds of ways to monetize a blog. Uh, it's, um, here's a question. Could you talk a bit about publications and organizations whose business model is to profit by not paying writers, uh, e.g. Huffington Post? Well, you know, uh, 
what can I say? I mean, it's your choice of whether you want to write for them. Um, there may be times when it may make sense to write for them. What I'd be really cautious about is writing for some entity, and I don't frankly know what you know Huffington Post standard contract looks like. I'd be really cautious about writing for somebody who isn't going to pay, but who wants exclusive and unlimited rights, oh. um, exclusive or unlimited rights. You know, if you're putting something out in some distribution channel, the goal in your contract, two goals for your contract, one, absolutely make sure that it's non-exclusive. So you retain the right to reuse it. They could go out of business. Their website could disappear tomorrow. You want to still be able to place it somewhere else. So I would say almost non-negotiable. I'd want you know non-exclusivity on the on the license, and ideally you want a time limit on the license. So, for example, if you're placing it to appear in a magazine, it's like you can print this in the print edition of the magazine and have it on your website for six months or a year. After which it goes away, unless you want to renegotiate and pay me to keep it up. Um, but you really don't want to give them you know life of the copyright rights for a one-time fee, or especially if the fee is zip. <laughs> um, you know, the bigger people who aren't paying are the republishers like Facebook and Google who are, you know, snarfing everything up. And that's a whole whole can of worms. And it has been an issue, not only for, you know, the writers union, but for other writers groups. And that's, um, uh, well, that's a whole nother can of worms. Anyone else? Actually, I knew somebody I met somebody who does write for the Huffington Post, and she makes her living as a as a caregiver lit to elderly people. But she says what she gets out of it is that she got to go to conventions, she get to, to go to congressional hearings, she'd get a press pass, she'd, uh, she'd expose herself to stuff that she wouldn't ordinarily do. And that was fun for her. I mean, if she can live on not very much money. <laughs> Well, you know, it, credentialing is an important thing. And I think that's a, it's, it may work for her. I think it's a, a bigger problem with freelancers. And this is an issue addressed through the NWU issuing its own press passes, which we can only do so much to get people to accept them. But, um, you know, what people, what will sometimes happen is people will have, and it can happen also with people with an educational institution or people who want to live overseas and they've got a sponsor for their visa, where you've got somebody who's sponsoring you for some credential that you need and they can get away with paying you shit because they know you need that credential in order to be able to do your other kind of work. So commonly, you know, it's, it's definitely a case for independent journalists that they've got a problem getting credentials and press passes and they'll end up getting paid shit by their primary client because they'll give them a credential that says they're writing for publication X. And then they have to go and fish on the sides for publication Y and Z that will actually pay them. Um, but they need the, the press pass or the assignment letter from publication X that doesn't really pay much in order to get in the door. That's a real problem. And I think we are attacking that as a union through consistent lobbying um, to get independent journalists recognized as journalists who should be entitled to press passes, who should be entitled to entree to those kinds of events. Anybody else? There was somebody, there was somebody at the, toward the beginning who said, what a great conceptual overview, a few concrete examples on how to, you covered some how to since then. Any others? <laughs> there, uh, there's a comment about, from Amy. Um, Amy, can you make your comment? No, no, Susan, I think it was Susan from Susan's. Susan had a comment. Oh, Upwork. Yeah. yeah. That just came that The say freelance writers can find work on their sites. Yeah, the, the content mills. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'll say this um, in terms of, you know, the places that aren't really paying um, and that are offering people to do this for exposure and reputation. If you want exposure and reputation, self-publish. Because if you are writing for Content Mill Q, 
you're building the brand and the reputation of content mill Q, not your own brand and reputation. Think back to what I said, your brand image, your brand equity, your reputation, your fan base, you may not be using that right now to generate money, but you can use that in the future to generate money in a variety of ways. And if you're busy building somebody else's reputation and brand and not your own, you're cheating yourself. It's so easy online to self-publish. Why would you, you don't need to go to somebody else's website to self-publish online. Why would you want to? What's the, what's, the, what's the model according to which that makes sense as the best choice of where to publish? I'm scratching my head. And I think it's that people aren't really thinking either about how easy it would be to self-publish if what you want is exposure or about the implications of branding. Again, coming back to my own, to my own uh, world of travel writing and to even the print genre. I was at a travel conference, a travel writing conference, uh, one of the leading ones uh, a few years ago with Tony Wheeler, who was the um, founder of Lonely Planet. Um, and his wife, Maureen, who was actually more of the business genius, but they were successful more, well, anyway, they were, they started out as self-publishers, but then they mi migrated into publishing work by a whole bunch of other people and migrated into uh, all rights contracts and a whole bunch of other exploitative stuff. And, you know, I remember at one point, you know, he was talking about the decision to stop putting the author's name on the cover of the book and just put Lonely Planet on the cover and spine of the book. It was like, he was very upfront. We don't want people to buy the book because of the author's name. We want them to buy the book because of the Lonely Planet name. And that's a rational business decision for him as a publisher. But there's an inherent contradiction between any third party's publisher's desire to build brand equity in their own brand and any author's desire to build brand equity in your own name. It, there's a question. Um, someone had someone had a question. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, I think it was Charles. You had a question, Charles. It said some writers with backlist of print um, books can get stranded when their publication go bankrupt. So how do you suggest book authors make sure they get possession of the book? plate or digital file if their publisher belly up? Good question. Um, one issue is to address that issue in the initial book contract to yeah, make sure. Hmm? Now go ahead. I just put an answer in. Okay. Um, you want to you know, that's something to address in the uh, in the initial contract for the book to make sure that you will get copies of the files at the conclusion of production or the production of each edition. Um, if you don't actually have the files, you can do a surprisingly good job taking the book, running it through optical character recognition to, you know, printed copy of the book, scanning it, running it through optical character recognition, and then re-editing it. You're going to have to do cleanup and editing, but you can regenerate the files if you need to from a printed copy. So I don't think the files are likely to be the issue. The issue is more likely to be the question of getting the rights. Now, it may be that the publisher has completely disappeared and there's no issue that they're going to reappear and you can just bring out your own new edition without worrying about it. You may be in a murky case where it's not clear whether there was a successor in, in bankruptcy. Um, this is something, too, that can be addressed either through reversion provisions in the, uh, in the original contract, for example, to say, if a new edition is not printed for X amount of time, the rights automatically revert. What you want is an automatic reversion clause, because if the reversion means you have to talk to the publisher and the publisher doesn't exist, you can't exercise your reversion right and you're kind of trapped. Then it becomes the real case of what's been described as an orphan work. Most genuinely orphaned works are works where the publisher has gone out of business and you can't find the rights holder because you don't know what the legal successor of the bankrupt publisher is. That, again, is an issue that I think could and should be addressed in legislation. For what it's worth, there's a provision in the U.S. Copyright Act that 
somebody is not muted here. There's a provision in the Copyright Act that lets you uh, reclaim your rights automatically after a certain number of years, but the number of years is large. I don't want to say because I don't remember, but I think it's more than 20 years. It might be, and there's a certain window of time, so it's a long period of time. But if the publisher has truly disappeared and a certain number of years have passed, there's a, there is a, a cumbersome process for recovering your rights. I think in most cases, if the publisher has truly just disappeared and didn't bother to assign a successor, you may well just be able to get away with taking the risk and reprinting the book yourself and not worrying about them. Um, but it is, a, it is a problem that could be addressed through better automatic reversion clauses in copyright law. And that is part of the uh, NWU's wish list for reform of the Copyright Act is for a better provision for automatic reversion um, of copyright to the author. Getting a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, um, I think um, you had, I think that was it. I, I don't know if anyone else have any questions that they want to, oh, okay. Just unmute yourself and ask your question if you, you have a question. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a poet and I, uh, I publish in a lot of journals and then I use the credentials of the journal publications as a sort of um, way <clears throat> to I, get I'm a book. Just went are there people hearing Martha? Yeah. I, I use the magazine publications uh, towards a reputation towards getting a book published, uh, which I've <clears throat> done. Uh, magazines that print poetry say, um, not on a piece of paper, but by email and by, well, and they say that rights revert to the author uh, upon publication. And I have relied on this utterly in order to do pretty much anything I want with some of my uh, published poems. Is that reliable? I'm really sorry. The battery in my headphones ran out and I lost a bunch of what you said, Martha. <laughs> um, okay. when, when my poems or anyone's poems, well, when mine are published in magazines, uh, the magazine says, usually by email and not on paper, that rights revert to the author upon publication, that they get first North American serial rights and those rights revert to the author upon publication. Yeah. So I figure I can do anything I want. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, it is. So that has been my way of branding myself, which is pretty much all I do. I <clears throat> almost never <clears throat> get any payment in money, but <clears throat> I also don't need a lot of money. So I'm kind of going for reputation and branding but I also feel a little bit <laughs> insulted <laughs> that we poets uh, really uh, just do not get paid and we are expected to do free marketing work for the books uh, for the publisher. We're expected to do unpaid proofreading. Um, the, the publishers are shifting a lot of what they are supposed to do onto the writer. Well, I think in terms of that last point, you know, that's the less the publishers are doing, the more. I don't know how to shut it off. I don't know how to shut it off. Okay. Um, 
the the less the publishers are doing of uh, to to add value to the proposition, you know, publishing with a traditional publisher is basically like a, a business joint venture. Um, where each side is investing something and then you have an agreement to split the revenue. And it doesn't make sense unless the, you know, the percentages invested correspond to the, to the revenue split. And if the publisher you know, isn't doing much editorially and they're not doing much marketing and blah, 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 well, what are you getting out of it? Why not self-publish? So that's one option in terms of books. The other thing, well, Making a living as a poet is tremendously hard. I get that. Mostly the people who make a living as poets are the people who have like academic academic gigs where they get paid to teach. Um, and that pays them to be able to, to write. Um, I realize it's very hard. It may be given the nature of the beast that at least for getting some money that it might lend itself to the kind of thing of you know, developing a mailing list, having a website, you know, asking people, you know, whether it's through Patreon or some other kind of thing, if you have followers who will kick in, you know, $2 a month as, as followers and fans to be the first to get to read your new work, let us say, that kind of thing, to the extent that you have developed a fan base and a following, you know, maybe as good as anything, um, it, it, it's hard to see exactly. I mean, I don't have a magic solution for poets to get paid. All right, I, I, I don't. Someone had a, oh, okay. Um, Susan. Um, Edward, if you were starting a blog or early, you were early on in a blog about how often would you suggest posting to get going? You know, I think there's an assumption that blogs are blogs, but the blog is a publication format that contains contain anything. You know, a blog could be, you know, a haiku every day or, you know, several posts a day, or a blog could be, you know, 3,000 words once every week or two. My blog happens to run to the latter, but that doesn't mean it works for everybody. What kind of stuff are you writing? My, you know, kind of general advice, which is, which is not exactly answering your question, but the general advice is think backwards. First think, who's the audience? What is it that they're looking for and wanting to read for what reasons? Where are they going to look for it? What are they going to want? What's going to deliver value to them? And then write you know, and publish in a way that will reach that audience with that material to meet those needs. One of the things I would say in terms of that feedback loop that's really useful to having your own website is you get web analytics. I can see what questions people have typed into Google that brought them to which pages on my site. And I can use that to gauge where there's interest that maybe I should be expanding that section of my site because there are visitors for it. And the more page views there are, the more ad views there are, and the more I can get from ad revenue from people reading those things. So you can generate a feedback loop um, that can help guide your future writing regardless of where you're gonna place it. You know, but I, I don't think there's some magic, you know, you have to post. If somebody says you must post every X days, there's somebody who's too rigid or too locked into a particular thing. It may work for them. You know, talk to a lot of people, but they're going to be people who are all over the map in terms of what they're writing in, in blog format. And you said it was Google Analytics. Um, yeah. You, okay. Thank you. I mean, there are other, there are other sources of analytics. Google Analytics has lots of problems. Um, like everything Google it does, um, you know, it will give you granular in insights into your readers, but it will also give Google granular insights into their readers that they will try to monetize. So there are ways you can run your own analytics on your own website, which is what I do. I don't actually use Google Analytics. I use my own analytics package, but that's a little more complicated to set up. So again, how much... How much do you know what you're doing? How much do you want to do it? You know, one of the good things about a website is you can rearrange it, you can change it, it can evolve, start slow, start small. You don't wanna 
change it too drastically overnight to the extent that you have developed a following. You want to, you know, the key thing is don't violate your readers' expectations. If they've gotten used to this is what they're going to get and they get something that's wildly different, they're going to go away. So if you've gotten into a pattern, try to keep with that. But the pattern can be very different for different writers. Tracy, I think Tracy had a question. Yeah. Uh, about 40 years ago, I self-published a book in a niche market. And what I did was I put ads in a, a um, niche magazine for send a self-dressed draft envelope and I'll send you a free chapter. And I got so many responses to that. Um, and and then, it said, then it was like, if you want to read more, buy the book. I sold 50,000 books that way. Wow. Um, what I'm wondering is what the, the market could be or the viability of like offering a chapter or two of a book for free and then at the end of it for the complete work. Send well, the, the, I think the most common modern form of that, and both publishers use this themselves and authors do, is to have a sample chapter or two that appears on the website. And then at the end, it's like, click here to buy the ebook right, or right. the printed book, right? That's like completely normal. And I think a lot of people expect to see at least a table of contents and maybe a sample chapter before they buy something. So again, you don't have to do it that way, but that's you know a good way to do it um, for a of lot course, of people. Of course, a lot depends on you being able to draw in enough people to the website. So. Well, you know, there are two different ways. One way is to sort of reach out and go find them. The other way is to put content that uses keywords that people are already searching for, so that if people are searching for topic X, Y, or Z, they find you. A lot of the people who come to my website aren't looking for Edward Hasbrook, the practical nomad. They're looking for, what do I do if I have a ticket on a bankrupt airline? It's actually one of my most popular pages on my website. It was something that was originally a blog post when an airline went bankrupt 15 years ago, but it's a perennial. Whenever a new airline goes bankrupt, I get thousands of visitors to that page because it comes up high in the searches for that topic. Mm -hmm. So if you have things that, depending, again, it depends really on the nature of what you're writing, how people are going to find their way. Um, you probably know who your readers are or potential readers are and how to find them better than a publisher does. Um, you know, that's, a, again, a, another whole can of worms. But if you're looking to your publish, publishers more and more expect book authors to come in, not just with a plan to write the book, but they expect you as an author to have the marketing plan. And once you've written the marketing plan, it's like, why am I taking this to a publisher instead of doing it myself? Why do I want to limit myself to five or 10, or if I'm lucky, 15% of the price of each book or ebook when I can be getting 100%. What am I doing to myself? Shooting myself in the foot. Um, and I don't mean to be like self-publishing is wonderful, but there are a lot of things that make sense for a self-publisher that like you couldn't make a living publishing through a mainstream publisher. People tend to think going to a mainstream publisher is the way to make money on a book. And well, if I just want to get the book out there, I'll self-publish. I actually think today it's exactly the reverse. If you can get a contract with a big publisher, it may get your book out to more places. But if you want to make money on your book, self-publish. That's my opinion for most, for most writers. Like Small that. presses tend to keep your book in print for a long time, though, compared to the large publishers. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, books, Any other know. questions? Uh, oh, Joyce. Um, um, Ed, um, I'm not sure how long you want to take this. Um, we're like 3.05 now. Um, how many more questions would you like? I'm I'm happy to stick around a bit. Okay. Um, if people have more questions, I'm happy to go away if you're done. Um, again, I hope this has been, been helpful. It's great to see so many smiling faces. Um, I just I just want to let people know that this is recorded and I'm going to turn it off now. Is that okay? Well, I don't know if you want to let my question go and, and then turn okay. it off. Okay, all right. Um, a quick question. How expensive is self-publishing? So if a person decides that self-publishing may be the way to go, how much money do they have to have up front 
how much money do they have to expect to invest in this before it, you know they can make a make it viable well self publishing covers a multitude of sins um, if you're talking about, for example, self-publishing a website or self-publishing a blog or self-publishing a self-published email newsletter for a subscription basis, your cost could range from no cash outlet and some number of hours of your own time to set it up or some number of days or weeks of your own time to set it up, or it could range up to paying a you know, web design or IT consultant to set up the infrastructure for that for you, um, which can be you know, any amount you're probably gonna be, you know, some of them will bill by the hour, some of them will quote you a flat price to set up that kind of a thing. Um, so it could be hundreds or thousands of dollars, depending. Um, if you're talking about self-publishing an ebook, Again, once you have the manuscript, you probably want to take it to a professional editor. So it's, you know, how much you're going to have to pay an editor, how much work does the manuscript need. You're probably going to want to hire a graphic designer. If you're not a graphic designer, to do a good look for the book. Again, you can pay a little or you can pay a lot for a freelance graphic designer to design a book or an ebook. If it's an ebook, at that point, you know, you want to put it out on, you know, Amazon, Kindle Direct, you're ready to go. If you're talking about printing, printed books and self-publishing, then you're getting into a whole another range of expenses for actually producing books and warehousing them. That can get really expensive. But I would not confine your thinking about self-publishing to printed books or even to books at all. And even if you make some of the material available in book form, you may find that the same material depending on the nature, can be broken down and made into web pages or used in other ways that may, over the long term, prove more profitable than uh, the same material in book form would be. So I hope that's of, of some help. I think that um, was very comprehensive, very informative, and thank you very much, because if I do anything, I'm a newbie at it, an ingenue. And I need all the advice and help I can get. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd also say, you know, a book, those of us who are on here who are book authors know a book is a big deal. Writing a book is probably going to take you longer than you think. It's going to be more work than you think. And finishing the manuscript when you think it's done it's not done. There are going to be rounds of revisions. There's more stuff that you never thought about. So you're embarking on a very long path. One of the good things about the digital world is it enables you to sort of test drive pieces of it and see which things resonate with readers, which work, which don't work, which get an audience. You know, I actually got my first book contract, not because I went and pitched a publisher, but because a publisher saw stuff that I was already writing that had gotten a following on social media. This is back on Usenet, which was the first social media platform in the 1980s and early 1990s. Okay, so this is decades ago before anybody had the term social media. But I was writing stuff and distributing FAQs on Usenet that had developed an audience and following, and a publisher saw that, saw that I could write, saw that there was an audience for this kind of writing, and they came to me and said, do you think you could take this kind of work and make it into a book? And I said, yes, um, naively, not knowing what I was getting into. <laughs> but at least I had some sense going into that, that there was an audience for what I was writing, and I had some sense of what kind of things worked and didn't work for them.